This is Genesis 49, 19. Gad, a troop shall overcome him, but he shall overcome it the last. Shalom, I want to start off giving all praises to Yahweh, Ba'ashem, Yahweh Shai, Ba'ashem, Rekwakvodash. Double honors to my teachers, the apostles of Great Millstone, peace and mercy to the elect, and Shalom to the one-third of Yasharala, also known as Israel, who today are known as the Negroes, Latinos, and Native Americans, who before losing their true heritage, were known as the Israelites of the Holy Bible, or the children of God. Now, in today's lesson, I want to go ahead and get into a recent story about the tribe of Gad. Now, the tribe of Gad, those today would be the Native American nations, the ones, the uh, Native Indians who dwelt in North America. In the Bible, you have Jacob's family, who Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Now, Jacob had two wives and two concubines. You have Leah here, who had the servant named Zipla, and you have Leah's sister, Rachel, who had the servant Bilhah. Now, Jake, Jacob, our forefather, he had relations with all these four women, and from these four women, he produced the 12 tribes, or the 12, his 12 sons, or, and then uh, one of his sons, Joseph, had two, two children, named Manasseh and Ephraim who replaced Joseph and Dan. Now, back to Gad. Gad came, comes out of the line of Zipla, right? So he'll be closest to the people we know today as the Brazilians, Venezuelans, and basically the, the, the southmost part of, of Southern America. Now, Gad, like I said, makes up the North American Indians. Now, how did Gad and the rest of the ten tribes come over here? They came over here during um, circa 700 BC, which basically would give them about 1800 years before they would be found by uh, Christopher Columbus and those who came after him to the to the New World. Now, this is recorded in uh, first as a prophecy in Deuteronomy 28:68. And then later, when that prophecy was fulfilled, at least for half of the nation of the northern tribe, in 2 Ezra 13 and 40. Let me, get, let me get these real quick. This is Deuteronomy 28 and 68. And Yahweh shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships by the way, way whereof I spake unto thee. Thou shalt see it no more again. And there ye shall be sold unto your enemies for bond men and bond women. And no man shall buy you. Now, let me break this one down. Now, this is happy. This is the last book of the Torah, the fifth book of Deuteronomy. Now, uh, the Torah or Deuteronomy explains the curses that and the blessings that Moses put in front of the children of Israel before he departed this world. Now, in that lesson, he went ahead. And explained how, how uh, if we did not follow the laws of the Most High, the Lord was going to bring us into Egypt again with ships. Now, Egypt is basically means bondage, right? When you look into the word, and also when you see that um, that we will see it no no more again. The it is Jerusalem, which is basically right in this area here, and and. We shall be sold unto our enemies as bond men and bond women, and no man shall save you. Basically, means no man is going to redeem us. So we're going to basically go into slavery, and we're going to stay in that lower, destroyed state. Which, when you look at the tribe of Gad on their, on their uh, basically death reservations, uh, that's that's uh, basically what's happening right now. So now let me go ahead and get 2nd Ezra 13 and 40 that explains how the 10 tribes came over here 2nd Ezra 13 and 40 those are the 10 tribes which were carried away prisoners out of their own land uh, in the time of Oshea whom Selamansar the king of Assyria led away captive and he's talking about how the northern tribe were taken captive and then taken to Assyria which is up here 
and he carried them over the waters. And some came, came they into another land. And so came they into another land. But they took this counsel among themselves that they would leave the multitude of the heathens and go forth into a further country where never mankind dwelt, that they might there keep their statutes, which they never kept in their own land. And they entered in through the Euphrates by the narrow places of the river. For the Most High then showed signs for them and held still the flood, but they were passed over. And, and through that country there was a great way to go, namely of a year and a half, and the same region is called Azarath. This is Azarath, the unknown land, right? Which is south of Babylon the Great. Now, let me get into this article, which is why I'm making this video. I was going, I was going online one day and I found this article, and I had known about about how the American settler, basically Edom, settling the Americas or stealing Gad's land, how he would hunt the buffalo, right? And I and I've seen, along with many others, have seen those huge pictures of the. Uh, Buffaloes uh, roaming the, the the wild the wilds, right? And just seeing how massive <coughs> excuse me. Because they used to basically roam over this whole western land, right? Before Edom came, right? Edom came and destroyed all of them, basically, you know, killing them for sport and also to destroy Gad, right? Because let me get into this article. The, where it tells you, kill every buffalo you can. Every buffalo dead is an Indian god. The American bison is the new U.S. national mammal, uh, but its slaughter was once seen as a way to starve Native Americans into submission. Let me go and read this. It was near the end of September, an unusual warm week in 1871, and William Buffalo Bill Cody and a group of wealthy New Yorkers stood atop a grassy hill near the Platte River in Nebraska, where two miles off they spotted six huge brown beasts. Cody was a legend of the frontier era. Heart myth conjured in dime novels. The men from New York had expected to find him as a desperado of the West, bristling with knives and pistols, but they did not. Cody was loquacious and friendly and an expert hunter he knew that with the wind blowing from behind the men risked their scent being carried to the animals and scaring them away then again a buffalo is a lumbering hirsute cow and the men were outfitted with some of the quickest horses and held the best guns owned by the u.s army which was was outfitting the hunting expedition. The army wasn't in the business of guiding hunting trips for its soft-skinned wall suitors, but it was in the business of controlling the Native Americans in the area, and that meant killing buffalo. One colonel four years earlier had told a wealthy hunter who felt a shiver of guilt after he shot 30 bulls in one trip. Kill every buffalo you can. Every buffalo dead is an Indian god. Cody and the men made a contest of the hunt. Whoever killed the first buffalo would win an engraved silver chalice. Years later, in an article he wrote for the magazine Cosmopolitan, Cody would call this trip the best equipped he'd ever taken. The army had supplied an army armed escort and 25 wagons filled with cooks, linen, china, carpets for their tents and the traveling ice house to uh, keep their wine chilled. The reason for such extravagance was undoubtedly because the New Yorkers were well connected, but also because Major Philip, Major General Philip Sardian, the man with the task of forcing Native Americans off the Great Plains and onto the reservations had gone along with them. This was a leisure hunt, but Sheridan also viewed the extermination of the buffalo and his victory over the Native Americans as a single inextricable mission, and in that sense it could be argued that any buffalo hunt was army business. After the men circled the herd, they charged down the hill chasing after the six buffalo eager, 
for the first kill. On Monday, President Obama signed the National Bison Legacy Act, making the American bison of the buffalo as it's more often called the national mammal. It's only the second American to represent the U.S. joining the bald uh, eagle. It's iconic, of course, because at, at one time, American settlers hit hunter, uh, hit hunter killed the Ameri the animal to near extinction. The tourists shot the animals from the window of trains as if the slaughter could last forever. Buffalo had once numbered more than 30 million and by the end of the 19th century, there were only a few hundred in the wild. Today, 20 to 25,000 remain in the public herds. And that's it. Now, if you want to read this, you can go back and uh, get into this. But um, let me get into continuing where I was on this lesson. So, before they started this process of killing off the buffalo in hopes of removing gad off the land, there were about 30 million bisons, right? And as you can see in this photo, in this one, they were, uh, they were, this, this is, this was a common sight in the, uh, in the Midwest, is basically herds of bison, right? Just everywhere, you know, there was enough. And before, uh, and, and this, and this was the a main food source of, of gad, and, and uh, again, you know, they had their perfect balance over here. But, uh, you know, they ultimately eat them. They wanted to get rid of Gad off the land, right? They wanted to uh, reduce the land he was here in. And contrary to what this this, this uh, says here, in Deuteronomy 33 and 20, it says, And of Gad, he said, Blessed be he that enlarges Gad. He, his, he dwelleth as a lion, and teareth the arm with the crown of, of the head. And that's, that's exactly uh, the opposite of what the so-called white people or Edomites did. They didn't enlarge Gad. In fact, they, they did the opposite. They, they, they shrunk him, right? They killed off a mass of them, just like these bisons. And again, in the beginning, there was 30 million of them. And they hunted them all the way down until there was less than 1,000. Some people even say there were only 100 left. But chances are there was probably less than 1,000. Nowadays, there's about 500,000, so about half a million as of today, which is what they've managed to to grow since, right? But here, here's an example of what one of these uh, these tours were like. At this season of the year, the herd of buffalo were moving southward to reach the canyon, which contained the grass they exist upon during the winter. Nearly every ro railroad train which leaves or arrives at Fort Hayes on the Kansas Pacific Railroad has its race with these herds of buffaloes. And a most interesting and exciting scene is the result. The train is slowed to the rate of speed of about equal to that of the herd. The passengers get out firearms which are provided for the defense of the train against the Indians and open from the window and platforms of the cars a fire that resembles a brisk skirmish. Frequently a young bull will turn at bay for a moment. This exhibitation of courage is generally his death warrant for the whole fire of the train is turned upon him, either killing him or some member of the herd in his immediate vicinity. When the hunt is over, the buffaloes which were, had been killed are secured and the choice parts placed in the, ba in the baggage car, which is a, at once crowded by passengers, each of whom feel convinced and is ready to assert that he was the shot that brought down the game. Ladies who are passengers on the trains frequently enjoy the sport and invariably calm all the game at the result of their prowess with the rifle. This solution of the case is of course accepted by all gentlemen and a more excited party of Diana's uh, 
it would be impossible to imagine, right? And notice here they use the, the term Diana, right? And Diana, if you if you know your uh, history with, with these idols, Diana goes all the way back to Ishtar, right? These freaking Edomites, as you can see them right here shooting at, the, at these buffalo, right? They're 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 fucking devils, right? Destroy. This is this is the uh, thing that these Edomites do. They destroy nature, right? This is just in there, and in, in, this is just what these devils do, right? Here you can see see them uh, taking the uh, the the pelts, and like I showed earlier, here's that famous photo of the mountain of skulls of bison, right? There were 300 million bisons in North America. These freaking devils almost made them go extinct. Just so that way they can get, get off the land, right? And they're actually doing the same thing nowadays, right? They're, um, when you look at it, um, when you look at what they're doing or what they did before, you know, if you look over in Dakota, these devils are at it again. On the land, on the shitty land that they gave Gad, right? The small part of, of land that they gave part, that they gave gave to Gad, now they're trying to get them off that land, right? So that way they could bring in their oil, their oil uh, reserves uh, or pipeline through, right? And then, as you can see, these devils, they bring their fucking armored vehicles. They even have uh, these, these sound, these radar systems here, which basically are microwaves, so that way they could freaking microwave your ass, right? This is, this is what these devils do, right? And this is why they're going to be destroyed off of the freaking planet. This is why their, their reward for all that they've done is going to be utter extinction of their entire race. All you so-called Caucasians, it's over for you. Right? And it's shit because it's shit like this, which is the reason. Because you do shit like this. Look, these these Gadites were trying to, to stand ground and in, in, in then uh, they, they try to cross the river so that way these fucking devils couldn't come any closer. And what do they do? They fucking spray them with fucking mace. Look at this shit, man. Look at this shit, man. You see these people here, man? You think you think these people, God wants to save these people? No, man. These, But you know what? I bet you these, these fucking monsters, they probably think of themselves as Christian, right? They're probably all Pentecostal Christians or whatever. I'm sure you got the, the, the random atheist in there. But they all probably think that they're God-fearing, God-following uh, people that go to church and don't understand why everybody can't get along with them. But it's because they do shit like this, right? They invade people's lands. Even got fucking women uh, with them and stuff, you know. And what they're doing now, they're even now uh, over in Canada. They're trying to push the same thing. Another pipeline. Watch this. Bracing for Standing Rock type protests in British Columbia and Washington State. Demonstrators led by native groups say the Canadian government is determined to push more oil from the tar sands to the west coast. RT's Alex Mahalovich is in Toronto with more. And the reason why they're trying to push through these pipelines is because America is gonna be cutting itself off from the European markets fairly soon. That's what you're seeing with all these trade wars. They're basically going to go against China and Europe and whatnot. And because what's gonna happen is America is gonna become an isolationist country. They're gonna basically deal the majority of their uh, of their trade with Canada and Mex Mexico. This is why all the trade and all the tariffs are being placed on these other countries because Trump, he's trying to make America great again, like his slogan goes, right? And doing so, he got to bring the jobs back. And to bring the jobs back, he has to basically get rid of the cheap goods and have them created here. And that's so, but that shit ain't gonna happen because the Lord's gonna come back and destroy him before he even gets to that part. But to do all that, they gotta they gotta secure power, you know, here in our homeland, which is why the Dakota pipeline's going and and this can Canada pipeline is being established now. But here's the thing: these pipelines are all ran by corporations, and these corporations aren't gonna sell to America just because we're because they're America. 
they're going to sell to whoever is the, the, the biggest buyer. This has already been talked about. These corporations have no loyalty to America. It's a big issue with tiny houses standing in the way. This August, the Canadian government is planning to expand the Trans Mountain Pipeline, which travels from the tar sands in Alberta through some of the most pristine nature on Earth, ending at the Pacific Ocean. The pipeline addition would triple the flow of oil to nearly 900,000 barrels a day, a fact many view as a threat to the British Columbia environment, a step backwards for the Canadian Green Movement, and an attack on some native groups in the region who have been negatively affected by the current, much smaller pipeline. Vincent Schilling is an Akwesasne Mohawk and associate editor of Indian Country Today. Uh, people have cancer um, based upon uh, these extraction processes and what bleaches into the air. And this pipeline, which has reported over 80 spills since 1961 from TransCanada, uh, crosses over countless, countless waterways. Processors who are calling themselves the Tiny House Warriors have already begun to wheel tiny houses to where the pipeline expansion is expected to be built. The houses are there to block the way. This is in addition to other demonstrations. Just this past weekend, over 100 First Nations and environmental supporters formed a flotilla in front of the Trans Mountain Terminal in Burnaby, British Columbia, where the pipeline ends. Decades old Trans Mountain Pipeline was bought by the Canadian government from Texas-based oil giant Kinder Morgan back in May for 3.5 billion US dollars. This after Kinder Morgan put the brakes on the project due to relentless protests against it. Now, the Canadian government has inherited the pipeline and everything that goes with it, which includes both pro and anti-pipeline groups, both who oppose the government's purchase. Many pipeline advocates see the purchase of Trans Mountain as a massive waste of money. Firstly, Kinder Morgan would have built the pipeline for free. Also, there's not much faith that the government's intent to sell the pipeline once it's completed will actually make Canada any money. In fact, many believe it's a losing prospect that could cost taxpayers billions. On the anti-pipeline side, there's a feeling of betrayal from the government that promised to be greener than its predecessors. Some believe the 3.5 billion could have gone towards clean energy instead of more oil infrastructure. Looking at the big picture, a poll released this week shows that the Trans-Canada Pipeline issue has split the nation. Conducted by Ipsos Public Affairs on behalf of Global News, the poll reveals that 42% of respondents support the Canadian government's decision to buy the pipeline, while 42% oppose it. However, for anti-pipeline groups, there is no division. To them, this is a project which must be stopped, and they are willing to put themselves out there. The tribal, the tribal nations have said this is you know, something that we will fight uh, till the what we have to fight for completely. Uh, there is a, uh, people who said that we declare this as a declaration of war on our people and are willing to do what it takes. Um, and I'm, I don't mean they're going to incite violence, but they are willing to put their lives on the line. And this type of outrage is expected on both sides of the border. Just south of British Columbia, Washington State is home to a branch of the existing Trans Mountain Pipeline, which feeds the four refineries along Puget Sound. Authorities in Canada and the U.S. have been bracing themselves for what's to come. And some believe these tiny houses in British Columbia are just the tip of what might become a much larger international iceberg. And the reason why there's so many Gadites in Canada, you know, besides them just being there naturally, is because most of them when Edom tried to put try to put uh, Gad into slavery he, sh he would ship them to Canada to be slaves there and to be re-indoctrinated this is why a lot of there's a lot of uh, Gadites over in Canada right now but uh, see this is so this just shows right people over here are talking about why don't you just you know let off of these uh, so-called white people why don't you just you know you know this is why you can't give these people um, any chances? You know, let me actually get that real quick. That's in um, Isaiah 26 and 10. It said, Let favor be showed to the wicked, yet will he not learn righteousness. In the land of uprightness will he deal unjustly, and will not behold the majesty of Yahweh Bashem Yahweh Shai. Right? And that's why you can't, that's why the Lord, when he comes back, he's going to have to put these Edomites out of, out of uh, power and ultimately put them into subjection, which, with, which will ultimately lead to the destruction and end of that 
of that that race because again if you don't realize this the so-called Caucasians out there are the direct seed line of, of the devil right they, they what is inside of them is what come came from the devil that the Lord through all these generations has managed to filter out until he's finally went to the to the last filtering which was between Esau and Jacob Jacob being Israel Esau is the last remnant that the Lord was able to remove the seed from uh, from uh, from from the human race I guess you could say right but here's this uh this is uh what's coming to Esau this is revelations 11 and 18 and the nations were angry and thy wrath is come and the time of the dead that they should be judged and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants the prophets and to the saints which all of them by the way are going to be Negroes Latinos and Native Americans and them that fear thy name small and great and shouldest and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth and who is this so again so who has destroyed the world who has destroyed the earth this just being one of the incidents it's a so-called Edomites or excuse me it's the Edomites so-called Caucasians so hopefully this video was edifying Akium till the next time Ba'ashem or Kwakwadash, double honors to my apostles and teachers of Great Millstone. Peace and mercy to the elect and shalom to the 130 Yashuala. Shalom.